walk through the ruins of old European towns and you'll find beams that should have vanished centuries ago, yet still hold their shape. Archaeologists pull posts from waterlogged foundations or long-forgotten defensive walls and discover wood so perfectly preserved that even modern carpenters shake their heads in disbelief. Hidden in medieval records, guild regulations and early city laws are references to a wood-treating method so powerful, so durable and so disruptive that many regions eventually restricted or outright banned it. Not because it was dangerous like modern chemicals, far from it. It was banned because it worked too well. It threatened forests, timber taxes and guild-controlled markets that depended on constant demand for new wood. In the 13th and 14th centuries, several European towns passed laws prohibiting the burning and oil-soaking of construction beams inside city limits. Some bans blamed the smoke, others cited fire hazards. But the real reason appears again and again in guild records. Wood treated with this method lasted far longer, reducing the need for replacement timber. And in an economy built on predictable material turnover, anything that stretched the lifespan of wood threatened powerful interests. Once you understand what this method was, and how ordinary villagers used it to make wood nearly rot-proof, it becomes obvious why it was restricted. The core of the technique combined controlled charring with deep oil saturation, creating a hardened, waterproof, insect-resistant shell. Today, many people associate wood charring with Japanese yakisugi, but Europe had its own version long before Japan formalized the practice. Medieval builders discovered that lightly burning the surface of a wooden beam created a carbonized layer that repelled moisture, fungi, and insects. But the secret wasn't only in the burn. After charring the surface, craftsmen soaked the wood in animal fats, pine tar, or heated linseed oil. The carbon opened microscopic pores that allowed these natural oils to penetrate deeply. When the wood cooled, the oil solidified and sealed the structure against rot. Posts treated this way often lasted several times longer than untreated wood, especially in damp ground. If you want to apply this method today, the principle is simple. Take a beam or post meant for ground contact. Use a torch or controlled flame to blacken the outer surface just enough to carbonize the first few millimeters. Brush off the loose soot. While the wood is still warm, apply hot linseed oil or pine tar. Let it soak in, then apply a second coat. You're recreating exactly what medieval builders once achieved with hearth fires and boiled oils, a protective shell that rejects water for years. But the most powerful part of the technique was the way medieval carpenters treated end grain. The exposed ends of posts where rot almost always begins. They understood that end grain absorbs water far faster than any other part of the wood. So they submerged these ends in boiling oil or tar until the material penetrated deep into the grain. Afterwards, they charred and sealed the ends a second time. This alone created posts that could sit in soil or under stone foundations for decades without failing. Because boiling large amounts of fat or tar created thick smoke and serious fire hazards, this soaking process became one of the most commonly banned steps within city limits. The third element of the method was the deliberate use of resin-rich woods, such as pine, larch and fir. Medieval builders didn't treat wood at random. They chose species that already had natural decay resistance. Heating these woods before oiling them drew resin toward the surface, sealing internal fibers even before oils were applied. Combined with charring and oil saturation, 
This created a multi-layered armor far stronger than untreated timber. Some regions even banned treating resinous woods specifically because it allowed a single beam to last 50 years instead of 15. You're using this today for homesteading or survival builds. Choose resin-rich species for the lower beams of sheds, barns and cabins. Heat them lightly before oiling to draw out the resin and let the medieval layers do the rest. The final piece of the system wasn't a treatment. It was environmental awareness. Medieval builders understood that even preserved wood needs airflow. They elevated beams, placed posts on stones, and avoided direct soil contact whenever possible. They knew that preserved wood still fails if moisture has nowhere to escape. The oils and charring didn't replace good drainage. They amplified it. Today, combine the medieval method with proper footings. Use gravel bases or stone pads and avoid setting posts directly into clay. Give water a place to go and the preserved wood will last far longer than anything you can buy from a hardware store. This was the medieval method so effective it shifted building economics and provoked bans. Not because it was unsafe, but because it outperformed every expectation. Even now, hundreds of years later, it remains one of the most powerful, low-tech wood preservation techniques available to homesteaders, off-grid builders, and anyone who respects the engineering wisdom of the past, just enough to carbonize the first few millimeters. Brush off the loose soot. While the wood is still